Welcome to St. Mungo's Let Us Worship God.
Let us pray. God, our Father, as we journey from where we have been to where we will be, fill us with your Spirit, that we might truly worship you and praise your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Father, as we journey from where we have been to where we will be, inspire us within the community of God's people to lift up our hearts and to renew our praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Father, as we journey from where we have been to where we will be, renew us as we renew our praise with psalms and hymns and all the songs of God's people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Father, as we journey from where we have been to where we will be, help us to recover that which has been lost and to rediscover all that unites us as those who are made in your image. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Father, as we journey from where we have been to where we will be, we give thanks to you for all your gifts to us, through Christ and by your Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. David has escaped having to fight alongside the Philistines against his own people, Israel. He and his men head back to Ziklag, only to discover it a burnt-out shell with their wives and families all gone. There is no trace of the raiders, no indication of where they have taken their loved ones. David and his company are distraught with weeping, and talk begins to go around the men that David is to blame and should be stoned to death. At this lowest of low points, David finds strength in the Lord his God, and consults God through Abiathar, the priest who is with them, as to whether they should go after the raiders, and whether they'll be able to catch them. The answer comes back via the ephod, which was part of the high priestly dress robes, or via the urim and tumim, which are held inside it. Go after them. Yes, you'll catch them. Yes, you'll make the rescue. The first reading today is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 30, reading verses 9 to 26. So David set off with 600 men. They came to the Bezor ravine, where some of them stayed behind. David and 400 men continued the pursuit, while two hundred men stayed there, too exhausted to cross the Bezor ravine. They found an Egyptian in the countryside and brought him to David. They gave him bread, and he ate, and they gave him water to drink. They also gave him a piece of fig cake and two raisin cakes. He ate and regained his strength, because he hadn't eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and nights. Then David asked him, Whose slave are you? Where do you come from? I am an Egyptian servant boy, he said, and the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I got sick three days ago. We had raided the arid southern plain belonging to the Cherethites, the territory belonging to Judah, and the southern plain of Caleb. We also burned Ziklag down. Can you guide me to this raiding party? David asked him. Make a pledge to me by God that you won't kill me or hand me over to my master, the boy said, and I will guide you to the raiding party. So the boy led David to them, and he found them scattered all over the countryside, eating, drinking, and celebrating over the large amount of plunder they had taken from Philistine and Judean territory. David attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day. He killed them all. No one escaped, except 400 young men who got on camels and fled. David rescued everything that the Amalekites had taken, including his own two wives. Nothing was missing from the plunder or anything they had taken, neither young nor old, son or daughter. David brought everything back. David also captured all the sheep and cattle which were driven in front of the other livestock. The troops said, this is David's plunder. 
David reached the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow him and had stayed behind at the Bizar Ravine. They came out to greet him and the troops who were with him. David approached them. He asked them how they were doing. But then all the evil and despicable individuals who had accompanied David said, We won't share any of the plunder we rescued with them because they didn't go with us. Each of them can take his wife and his children and go, but that's it. Brothers, David said, don't act that way with the things the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed us over to the raiding party that attacked us. How could anyone agree with you in this plan? The share of those who went into battle and the share of those who stayed with the supplies will be divided equally. So from that day forward, David made a regulation and a law in Israel, which remains in place even now. When David returned to Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah and to his friends. Here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies, he said. Amen. The second reading is from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, reading verses 12 to 14 and 18 to 27. The body of Christ has many different parts just as any other body does. Some of us are Jews and others are Gentiles. Some of us are slaves and others are free. But God's Spirit baptised each of us and made us part of the body of Christ. Now we each drink from that same Spirit. Our bodies don't just have one part, they have many parts. God has put all parts of our body together in a way that he decided is best. A body isn't really a body unless there is more than one part. It takes many parts to make a single body. That's why the eyes can't say that they don't need the hands. That's why the head can't say that it doesn't need the feet. In fact, we cannot get along without the parts of the body that seem to be the weakest. We take special care to dress up some parts of our bodies. We are modest about our personal parts, but we don't have to be modest about other parts. God put our bodies together in such a way that even the parts that seem the least important are valuable. He did this to make all parts of the body work together smoothly, with each part caring about the others. If one part of our body hurts, we hurt all over. If one part of our body is honoured, the whole body is happy. Together, you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is part of his body. Amen. And may God bless these readings from his holy word. David and his men have to go quickly to close the gap on the unknown raiders they're pursuing. By the time they get to the Bezor Ravine, some of the men are almost dead from exhaustion. They've already come from the muster of the Philistine army back home to Ziklag. That's about 60 miles. And then they have the emotional shock of realising that their wives and families have been taken to be sold as slaves, and no one knows where. David is able to find strength in the Lord his God, and he gets God's encouragement to pursue whoever has kidnapped their loved ones. And so the men go about another dozen or so miles further south, travelling as fast as they can. No wonder about a third of the men can go no further and have to be left in charge of the supplies at the Wadi Bezor. The remaining men continue the search southward and they come across a starving, dehydrated Egyptian slave left to die in the open by his Amalekite master. He's been discarded like a piece of broken machinery without food or water or any trace of human kindness after he grew sick and simply wasn't of use any more. That shows you how callous an Amalekite can be to his slave. Now it's important you understand that this information is not just useful to David, but it's essential He provides the vital information that David needs. This man, 
thrown away by other human beings as worthless, is evidence of God's real provision for David, that the Lord's goodness and kindness are actively pursuing him. Now, after rehydrating the slave and giving him fresh energy from their provisions, they find out he was part of the raiding party on Ziklag. The slave makes sure that they promise not to kill him, and he also asks a promise not to return him to his master. The Old Testament law is unique in the ancient Near East, in its laws on slaves from other nations who seek protection in Israel. In Deuteronomy 23 it says, When runaway slaves from other countries come to Israel and ask for protection, you mustn't hand them back to their owners. Instead, you must let them choose which one of your towns they want to live in. Don't be cruel to runaway slaves. So the man agrees to guide them to the raiding party. The Amalekites are nomads. They, they don't live in any permanent place. And it takes inside knowledge to know where they'll camp next. Through this discarded man, God's promises to David, made through the holy objects in the high priest's robes, are fulfilled. Yes, you'll catch them. Yes, you'll make the rescue. And so they overtake the Amalekites, who are having a massive feast, a blow up and a booze up, with all the plunder they've taken from the people of Philistia and Judah. And the surprise assault succeeds. David and his men get their families back. Nothing is missing from the plunder or anything that they'd taken, neither old nor young, son nor daughter. In other words, they've got there before any of the prisoners can be sold off to the slave merchants. But when they get back to the Bezor Ravine, there's an unpleasant episode involving some of the men. They have a grievance. I've slightly intensified their language, but not much. So you get the point. We don't want to share any of the plunder that we rescued with those skivers. I mean, they didn't even come with us. They can just take their wives and children and buzz off. But that's as much as they're getting. Now, how does David treat this situation? He doesn't deal with it with anger. He doesn't say, listen up, you horrible, miserable shower. He calls them brothers. He treats them as part of the family. And he says to them, don't act that way with the things that the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed over to us the raiding party that attacked us. Do you see what he's trying to do? He's trying gently to change their perspective on things. They see it all in terms of what I've done and what should my share be. But David reminds them of what God has done for all of them. He tries to get them to see God's hand in what's happened and God's generosity to them all in what they've been given. Who says you are better than others, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 4. What do you have that wasn't given to you? As Christians, we have to remember that our achievements, our possessions, our resources, our gifts are what the Lord has given to us so that we can share the benefits with others. Now, the storyteller gives a glimpse of the future king and lawmaker that David will one day become. And David, even though he isn't yet king, makes a kingly judicial ruling. The share of those who went into battle and the share of those who stayed with the supplies will be divided equally between them. 
And the storyteller records this with a comment that brings us right out of the time frame of the story. From that time onward, it was a binding ordinance for Israel, right up to the present time. That's the time of the storyteller. Now, what has this ancient military policy got to do with us? Well, David has begun a new way of doing things in Israel, and it's got deep roots in the law of Moses and the idea of justice that we find in, in that. Now, Walter Brueggemann, in his book on First and Second Samuel, unpacks what's happening here. He says, the old basis had been that the strong control and dominate distribution. After all, who had stayed behind with the baggage? It was the exhausted, the weak, the tired, the frightened, the failed. And from the perspective of war policy, they weren't entitled to plunder because they didn't risk. But David insists on equal shares for all, for now the basis of distribution is not risk or victory or machismo, but simply membership in the community. In the New Testament passage that we read today from 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul takes a well-known picture of the state functioning like a body and he alters it to show what being part of the Christian community should mean. Roman speakers often use the picture of society as a body to emphasise how the high status movers and shakers were terribly important to its smooth running and other people, the low status people such as slaves or outsiders, they might be necessary but they're personally dispensable. Now, Paul uses the picture of the body not as an image of society, but of the Christian community, the body of Christ. And it has people from different religious and cultural backgrounds. Some of us are Jews, others are Gentiles, and people from very different ranks in society. Some of us are slaves and others are free, says Paul. But they've all become members of the Christian community through God's action, through God's kindness and grace to them. They've responded to the message about Jesus. They've been baptised by the Spirit of God. And they've made, been made part of the body of Christ. Now, remember, Paul uses this picture of the body as community in a very different way from the pagan authors and speakers. He says that God put our bodies together in such a way that even the parts that seem the least important are valuable. God did this to make all parts of the body work together smoothly with each part caring about the others. You see the difference? from the way the pagan writers use this image. God wants Christians to show their concern for each other, to think of the impact of their actions on others. As Paul says in Romans 12, love each other like members of your family, like brothers and sisters. Be the best at showing respect, at showing honour for each other. The church, the Christian community, should be a caring community, always aware that everything we have and are is because of the Lord's kindness and goodness to us. Sister, let me wipe your tears Brother, let me bear your fears Come on, every 
door to every sun Let us walk in love for we are one Though we walk along and broken road We are here to bear each other's love And forgive as you've forgiven us Let us walk in love for we are one The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Words from Psalm 34. Let us pray. Father God, we pray for the people of Afghanistan. Help them feel the comfort and peace that only comes from your powerful presence. Give those who believe in you courage to stand strong in their faith and be a strong witness for you. Be with those who do not believe in you. Help them to see the peace in your followers and allow the Holy Spirit to stir in their hearts as they witness this. We pray for leaders around the world. Give them clarity, wisdom and care. Give us understanding and patience for their decisions, even when we may not agree with them. 
Help them ultimately to look to you for guidance and allow the Holy Spirit to nudge them to pray. We pray for those who spread your gospel in Afghanistan. Help them to be a light in the darkness for you, bringing your comfort, peace and assurance to those who are afraid. Let their witness affect everyone around them and give them courage and strength, if need be, to defend your name under persecution. We pray for the Taliban as you have taught us to pray, that your spirit would work in them and soften their hearts. Only you truly know their hearts, Lord. You alone can work in their hearts and minds. We know that you came to save each and every one of us. All our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus, praying in his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. May the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you. Amen.